Hi guys, Dane here, and today I am going to be reviewing a couple of poetry books. So we have The Debris Inside My Mind, First Aid for My Soul, and More Debris Inside My Mind, More First Aid for My Soul by Keith Terry. So Keith Terry uh, is the father, I think, I'm like 95% sure of that, of somebody I went to secondary school with. Um, and he reached out to me a little while back and asked if uh, I would like to read and review these. Um, I don't know where to start. Let's start with the debris. In, well, obviously that's the one to start with. I was, I normally read the blurbs, but the blurb on this one is more of an author bio, and then the other one is more of a blurb. But actually, that kind of works okay. So we'll start with this one and the blurb with this one, which is more of an author bio anyway. So this is the first collection of the debris inside my mind. Dane reads. Keith Terry was born in 1955 and lives in Staffordshire. Having recently celebrated his 37th wedding anniversary, Keith is married to a professional musician and piano teacher and has two children in their late 20s, early 30s now. Keith is a former police officer with a 37 year long exemplary career, during which time he has performed duties in a variety of roles from plain clothes and vice to traffic. Whilst on traffic, Keith spent nearly 10 years performing duties in accident reconstruction and the investigation of serious and fatal collisions. He also conducted and assisted in planning anti-terrorist and VIP protection operations. His services diversified from walking the inner city beats of Birmingham to VIP escort protection in London. The final nine years of his service were spent instructing blue light response, pursuit driving alongside VIP escort anti-terrorist driving techniques, before retiring with a back injury. During his service, Keith has seen, in his words, too much shit, bodies, blood and gore. This somewhat dark side and skewed view of life is reflected in much of his poetry. Keith found poetry by sheer luck and realises that for him, writing poetry is cathartic and stress relieving. After many years of nightmares caused by the traumatic events he has seen, Keith has realised putting his fears into words is very psychotherapeutic. Having put his thoughts on paper, the nightmares have now ceased. The majority of Keith's poetry is written in the southwest of France where he has a bolt hole to escape the rigours and pressures of everyday modern life. So as I always do with poetry, I'm just going to read you some of the poems that I enjoyed or that I highlighted for various reasons. Uh, and then I'll share my thoughts and rating for both of these books at the end. Um, I will say it's rhyming poetry, which isn't normally my cup of tea. I can appreciate it. It's just, I suppose, as a poet myself, it's not what I write. I prefer free verse. He does do a little bit of free verse here and there as well, but it is mostly rhyming. So uh, we'll start, perhaps appropriately, with my first one. Candice was my first one back in 1978, found murdered in a stairwell in the flats on an estate. They sent me there that fateful day to preserve the primary scene, make sure no one left the block if returning where they'd been. I looked upon her body, the subject of a rape, lying there on that cold hard floor out of place behind the tape. Her afro hair or a dark brown skin, wool so stark and white, contrast sharp and so austere it did not seem quite right. The picture of her lying there, position almost fetal, life extinguished far too soon in a manner far too brutal. I saw me on the news that night, my parents oh so proud, but I bowed my head and cried again, I'm a bloke, that's not allowed. Funeral delayed, parents distraught, a family ripped apart, and others like ripples on a pond, a list too long to start. In life I never knew her, we had never even met, in death our encounter was so short, but Candice I can't forget. Over my time I've seen some shit, bodies, blood and gore. During 30 years I've seen too much, I pray to see no more. Of course there were many others, lives taken or defiled, yet it's the image of Candice seared in my mind, for she was my first dead child. So as you can see, these do really take on some like darker subject matters, which I'm all for. So we have The Flex here, another dark one. I like to play with children, it was meant in the literal sense. The atmosphere was ramped up, taut, nail-biting, tense. His besuited brief beside him looked uncomfortable in his role. Words spoken by his client made him work to keep control. The interview room was basic, some would say austere, but that all fell by the wayside as words spoken with a sneer. The black topped wooden table and recording there to see. Discarded plastic tape wraps, a red blinking LED. The children liked it really, they'd do anything for treats. I didn't do them any harm, the kids did it for the sweets. I took them to the storeroom at the rear of the main shop. They were quiet, non-objected, no one asked for me to stop. Kept my hands upon the table, must keep myself in check. The cable to the telephone would fit nicely round his neck. I gripped my pen so tightly, my knuckles turning white. My tone still falsely calm, quiet and polite. That cable could be my failure, curled against the wall. It would take so little effort for me to lose it all. The thought is tempting, perhaps she would object. But he'd be the winner, my career would be wrecked. 
Our eyes across the table, he looked but could not see. He'd done naught that he thought wrong as he stared across at me. That frightening fact unsettling, but at least it meant he'd talk. Evidence emerging slowly, but free he would not walk. He did, of course, freed on bail before the case was heard. A community with different agendas now galvanised and stirred. His shot was daubed and damaged, vigilantes did their stuff. Mostly vandals who don't give a shit, others who'd heard enough. Two years in prison, but we know that that means one. A lifetime for the kids, childhood completely gone. Virtually all in isolation, Rule 43 it's called. Only because the other lags find themselves appalled. I'd won a little battle, but I haven't won a war. As I know for in my future, there will always be one more. He'll start again in a few years time with rippling effects. And then when I hear, I will once more think I should have used that flex. Okay, here we have the motor car. For some it inspires a poem, the Chancellor exploits it for tax. For others it's used as a mode to win, for a few a route to relax. The car is such an enigma, it takes as well as gives. For something so mechanical, you'd think it almost lives. Its emissions try to choke us, it vomits death and dirt. It costs us all a fortune, but it's our lives it really hurts. One million pounds per fatal, they say that is the cost. But really it is family life that suffers the greatest loss. There's no monetary cost to tragedy, it's the supreme price that we pay. Wasted lives young and old, taken every single day. Metal perversely caresses our bodies, ribs kiss and then puncture our lungs. The arteries tear, the lungs they burst, blood spews across our tongues. Healthy bones snap as they hit the dash, the car stops, our organs keep moving. The NHS tries to use what is left, but the heart is so subject to bruising. Destruction of family, that is the real price, not the metal, the plastic or transport. It's the funerals and grief, the tears and the strife, not the cost at the pump on the forecourt. We try to be eco to save the world, fuels we strive to improve. But our planet still suffers as well as our lives, in the end all of us lose. For some it inspires a poem, others it may take their breath. The car drives us to our independence, but ultimately propels us to death. And then we have, this one's quite interesting, The Red Wheelbarrow, uh, and this is inspired by William Carlos Williams. So he's printed a, a William Carlos Williams poem next to it, which actually I suspect probably isn't out of copyright, but we'll let him get away with that. So this is William Carlos Williams, The Red Wheelbarrow. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. And so this is inspired by The Red Wheelbarrow. The rain glazed wheelbarrow was not actually red, it was dry and mud coated, more light brown instead. As for the chickens, not one could be seen, in fact the whole farmyard had lost so much of its sheen. The rain that once glazed it, on which all life depends, causes decomposition, even death in the end. Oxide corrosion continued abuse, from initial dependence to no further use. Hold leaking and wobbly, neglected and spurned, now used as a shelter, ignored and upturned. So no more white chickens, no barrow of red. But Williams's poem, it's stuck in my head. And I just think that's kind of interesting as well because Williams tend to write free verse too. I mean, he wrote a bit of both, but it's just interesting to see um, a rhyming poet inspired by a free verse poet, you know? And Williams is actually one of my, probably one of my favorite poets as well. He's not my favorite, but he's probably top five. Okay, it was no accident. Road accidents, I would dare to imply, are as rare as rocking horse shit. Accidents, no, there's invariably fault, collision the word I submit. Drivers the problem, what is it they cause? They thoughtlessly bring forth death. Roads play no part yet, are blame to the nth, you cannot catch your breath. What actually happens in these collisions? How fractured do lives become? The impact is not all metallic in force, it's grief and anguish to which we succumb. Airbags explode, endeavour to protect, yet ruptured chests still buckle the wheel. Adrenaline surges, anaesthesia fails, pain induced by twisted steel. Metal perversely caresses our bodies, ribs kiss then puncture our lungs. The arteries tear, our lungs they burst, blood spews across our tongues. Healthy bones snap as they hit the dash, the car stops but our organs keep moving. Whilst limbs are violently ripped apart, internally constrictive crushing. Faces try travel, twixt the roof and screen, root hindered by mirrors and visors. Laminate screens seeks to contain, shredding skin like twin bladed razors. Smears on the road, crimson clues to the cause, though the reason invariably speed. Perhaps lack of concentration or inconsiderate self-centered greed. Critical speed, pedestrian throw, skid test to help us explore. Coefficient of friction expressed in mood to find speeds and understand more. Mutilation merely precursor to agony returning again. Ripples on ponds radiate hurt, mental anguish following pain. One million pounds the measure of fatals, the attributed monetary cost. In reality, many family lives suffer incalculable undeserved loss. 
The truth in fact is plain for us to see the price unacceptably high, yet we still see those fools every day, all we can do is ask why. And I thought that's interesting because that's almost like a reprise of the earlier poem as well. It even reuses, I think in one or two cases it was like the exact same lines and in other cases it was similar lines, uh, similar language. Um, but I think both poems kind of stand up by themselves. Lost and found, crimson walls and furniture painted by wrists, deliberately, desperately twice slit. Eyes now closed to a world on someone who perceived they did not and could not fit. Blood-scented air permeates a neglected room, corroding Gillette discarded, death discernible all around. A dejected soul sitting slumped, lost in mind, waiting to be found, but not by me. Okay, so this one's Life's a Long Song. Life's a long song, said Jethro Tull, and he was right all along. Our lives are a myriad of pathways, capably conveyed in song. Our childhood days are nursery rhymes, uplifting and worried carefree. Our teenage years push boundaries at times when you know everything and everything's free. Those become the slipknot years, parent advisory on CD cases. Scream lyrics assault our wired up ears, corn with a K and white faces. We don't want a job, no need to learn, life's a long song with a drink. Our lives turn inward, no concerns, in fact no need to think. Then responsibility with years arrives, moody blues come with age. Subtler rock reflects our lives, melody replaces rage. The volume often reduces, that's not to say the past was wrong. I can see clearly now produces, life's a long song. We move on toward the adult years, births and marriage and loss. Laughter and tears for souvenirs, responsibilities and jobs. Dancing in the dark in pubs, late nights and revelry. Becomes coffee bars and knitting clubs and our sports now on TV. Hospital visits more frequent, stairway to heaven comes along. As we live beyond help and treatment, remember that life's a long song. So this one, I kind of wanted to highlight this one as well because it's got references to Slipknot and Corn, which are bands that my friend Rob, who sent me these books, used to be super into back in the day. Uh, it does say parent advisory on CD cases. It actually used to say parental advisory. Um, Corn with a K and white faces. I assume he's talking about white faces of other bands because I don't think Corn ever wore corpse paint. Could be wrong. Uh, and also, the Life's a Long Song said Jethro Tull and he was right all along. Wasn't Jeff Jethro Tull a band? According to Wikipedia, Jethro Tull are a British rock band formed in Blackpool, England in 1967. He wasn't right all along, they were right all along, just to be accurate. Uh, and finally, the poem that sums everything up. Lucky man. I really am so lucky to have health, my love, my wife, my children and my happiness. In other words, my life. That's a good one. I like that one. Okay, so now we're moving on to more debris inside my mind. More first aid for my soul by Keith Terry. This one has more of a traditional blurb, so I'm going to go ahead and read that to you and then we'll check out some of the poems. From suicides to sunsets, dementia to desire, paranoia to perfection, and more significantly, torment to tranquility. This collection of poetry, in a somewhat haphazard order, is very much a release of debris from inside my mind and at the same time acts as first aid for my soul. The poem, my first one, was first written in March 2010. It was an exercise to confront a traumatic incident that had been the catalyst of my nightmares for over 30 years, the rape and murder of a 14-year-old child. Following the penning of this poem, my nightmares ceased, though it should be noted that the reader is spared many of the gruesome details. Cathartic in the extreme, this set me on the road to write numerous poems and to expel further debris from inside my mind. This deep and traumatic subject matter is hopefully balanced by poems of a soft and gentle nature, together with light-hearted stories and rhyme. Exhilaration and pleasure sit alongside horror and senselessness, but ultimately countenances that love and hope can overcome despair. So this has, uh, as well as I say, two or three uh, poems that are republished. It's also got some things that are like experiments with shape. Um, I, I can show you those actually. So we've got some acrostics and some shapes here, um, which are all right. I mean, I, f I find any poems like that, they're always kind of gimmicky because of the nature of the type of poetry it is, you know. He also signed this, so he said, To Dane, best wishes and apologies for the poem on page six, Keith. So we're going to read the poem on page six. Um, and the reason he apologised for it is because he knows that I'm vegan. So this is what to take on the ideal picnic. 
Real pork pie crammed with gluten, defrosting ice cream with oodles of fruitin', that National Trust rug with a waterproof bottom, and of course a Tupperware with choices of cheese in. Large kettle crisp Sainsbury's flavour of the day, and a small deck of cards should we choose to play. All encased in a basket of wicker, together with a cool bag with the wine and the liquor. A Bordeaux red from the Gironde's left shore. Anything else I can't think of much more. Perhaps the person for whom I truly care, because a picnic is nothing unless it is shared. I imagine because I don't know where the Gironde or the Giron is. I assume it's French because a lot of his poems are inspired by French, in which case it will be a soft G, so it will be Giron. Okay, uh, Fingers, 1977, College Road, Spark Hill, Birmingham. The location of my first sudden death, the deceased discovered clinging to the legs of a wooden chair. I broke his fingers one by one, slowly, surely, and more to the point deliberately. Not the thumbs, just the eight, this anonymous man unable to wait. Pornography strewn out and covered in the room, curtains drawn to a cold, damp February afternoon. From his hands I released glacial grip, his grasp taken in the final throes of life, in a failed attempt to rise from a precipitous realisation of impending death. Naked, tragic, pathetic, alone and unloved, especially by the silicon-enhanced falseness of scantily clad non-seeing eyes on a page, eyes that will never see or care of a dying man's demise. Rigor mortis, the only stiffness his body will now know. Dull, dingy, squalid, rented bedsit, now reeking of shit and death. Grip broken, chair legs released, body bag prepared. And I like this one because as well as being nice and suitably bleak, uh, it's also non-rhyming and again, I just tend to enjoy non-rhyming poetry more. Macallion, 1977, my first official post-mortem at Birmingham Mortuary. Also the subject of my first murder, Sparkbrook. One pub, one night, one drink, one fight. One argument, one knife, one wound, one life. One moment of madness, one life-changing lunge. One memory and life, one cannot expunge. One hole between ribs, one punctured heart. One brushed steel table, one post-mortem starts. One more slicing knife, one bone-cutting saw. One set of scales, one organ more. One hose for the blood, one pungent acrid smell, one of so many, one reminder of hell. Nicely done. Here we have a full English breakfast. This is the last one I'm going to read from this. It's not that, um, that I didn't enjoy this. I actually think this was probably my favourite of the two. I just didn't find as much that I wanted to tab out and share. I, so I think the poetry was better. Um, but there just, as I say, there wasn't as much that I wanted to share. So a full English breakfast. And uh, this is another one for the vegans. <laughs> Everyone loves a full English, bacon, eggs, sausages, beans, we all know what a full English means. Veggies and vegans will no doubt cast scorn, yet I'm sure still enjoy one combined with soya or corn. What of the eggs, fried of course, coalescing slickly with Heinz tomato sauce. Linda McCartney's meat-free boast is a mere distraction from dunking your toast, into oozing yellow from soft runny yolks with fried white bread dripping soaked. Golden hash browns and sliced black pud, just a wonderful smell if only I could. Avoid all the calories of the stuff that is fried, but it's not the same grilled, I know because I've tried. But I've failed, I've been weak for it's so easy to distinguish between healthy and tasteless and that heavenly full English. Full English breakfasts are the bomb, even when you're vegan. So yeah, these two books, where's the other one gone? Over here. The Debris Inside My Mind and More Debris Inside My Mind. We have the first book, 3.5, second book, 3.5, but a slightly higher one. I uh, did enjoy them. As I say, um, I think with these, they're very much uh, an attempt at like um, self-therapy. And so you kind of have to respect them for that. I don't think Keith Terry is ever saying or setting out to be the next poet laureate or anything like that. Um, but having said that, there are some really good ideas in here. I would say these are sort of mid-tier from the books that I've been sent, but a lot of them are from published poets and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and I particularly like the darkness of them as well. So these probably aren't for everybody, but if uh, these readings have intrigued you, check them out. So there we have it. That's what I made of The Debris Inside My Mind and More Debris Inside My Mind by Keith Terry. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you're going to check these books out. I imagine you haven't read them because he's not, again, he's not like a household name or anything like that. Um, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.